D. James Kennedy Ministries presents Truths That Transform. Socialism is alive, though not well, in America. If we continue to do what Detroit did for 40 years, give people things they didn't work for, give them social programs, we can expect this to happen all over America. This is Truths That Transform. Thank you for joining us on this edition of Truths That Transform, a viewer-supported program. I'm Frank Wright, president here at D. James Kennedy Ministries, and I hope you'll visit our website, which contains a wealth of free video, audio, and digital resources, all from a biblical perspective. You can find it at djameskennedy.org. Today, we continue our month-long look at socialism, which is gaining a foothold in America in a way that nobody could have imagined 20 years ago. The government continues to expand into every facet of life, and a major presidential candidate who is an avowed socialist has actually won presidential delegates. What has led to this new acceptance of socialism? Is it ignorance of history and its record? Certainly that, but its cheerleaders in the media have played a significant role as well. Joining us to talk about that is Brent Bozell, president of the Media Research Center, who joins us from Reston, Virginia. Brent, welcome. Thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me. Well, any clear-eyed look at socialism, it seems to me, reveals a grim landscape littered with not just economic failure, but human tragedy as well. Is that a fair statement to make or is that too much? No, it's not, um, but I think you just hit on it. A clear-eyed view of socialism. What this country has is not a clear-eyed view of socialism. Um, it's one of those things where I find it rather, rather interesting. And you know, when you're a conservative, when you're a Christian, you have no problem at all um, championing those, those labels. Socialists do have a problem with that. Witness this, this administration has spent the last eight years denying its socialism is socialism. Right. Witness Bernie Sanders, the, the socialist, running as a Democrat, not running as a socialist. So, so, so the, the public isn't being told this is socialism, and it's not getting it overwhelmingly all in one bite. It's getting it in pieces growing and growing and growing, and people are now waking up and they're saying, my goodness, this has become a socialist country. Yeah. So many in the news media seem to be cheerleaders for big government in general. Do you think that's sort of paved the way to accepting the ultimate of big government socialism? Sure. Uh, you know, with big government, you get to a point where, where you know, it's, it's like pregnancy, where you, you can't be half pregnant. Uh, you can't be half socialist. You are, you're not. Um, when, when, you're, when your mandate is that the government is the default position, on on uh, on uh, solving any issue. That's the socialist world. Um, that that world says that the individual um, is not responsible for himself. It says that liberty is not the important uh, concept. That government, um, the government control, government maintenance of the public order is what's required. That's socialism. Surveys of people under age 30 show a startling willingness on the part of some to embrace socialism. Is that just the, the Winston Churchill thing? You know, if you're 20 and you're not a liberal, you don't have a heart. And if you're 30 and not a conservative, you don't have a brain. Or does the media play a role in this as well? Yeah, I, I, I kind of think that this has moved um, in a generation. I, I don't know that when I was in my 20s, I was surrounded by people uh, as naive as they might be who pined for socialism. Uh, you are seeing that today um, yeah. because I think there's a disenchantment um, with, with the non-socialist world or with the conservative world uh, or the perceived conservative world that really doesn't offer a solution other than, than the, the theoretical. But when it comes time to fighting for liberty, um, they're nowhere to be found. So, so, so those who would be sympathetic to, to, to the anti-socialist 
world are, are, are rather dismayed, while those who are in favor of it are rather loud. Um, and so those are the ones you're hearing from. Yeah. You uh, have spoken to a lot of young people over the years with the, the state of the news media being so biased. What do you recommend to young people do in order to get you know, information that's not so freighted with ideology? Uh, we have a lot more choices today, but what do you recommend young people to do to discover the truth about all these issues, especially socialism? Frankie, you just hit on something. You, you said called it information. I'm convinced we're leaving the news era and we're entering the information age. You no longer wait until 6 o'clock to get your news or wait to read your, your, your newspaper. In fact, people don't read newspapers. Um, you want information, you pick up, you, you take your phone out of your pocket, and anything you want is right there, available to you. So, and, and that's what, what, what society is now doing. So, so the news media are, are, are losing influence, although they still have a great deal of influence. What, what, what young people particularly have to be careful of is the information they're receiving. You know, this is the wild, wild west. We, 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 can, we, can, we can condemn or criticize uh, the old media for not following the rules. But in the new media, there are no rules. And right. what you're seeing is just a lot of, of really bad pseudo-journalism coming out from the left and the right. Where, where there's a lot of black helicopter stuff coming out, which gets you audiences, but doesn't tell you the truth. So, so I would tell you, uh, young people, be, be very discerning. Look for those, those sites that are going to give you accurate, truthful information. Don't look for sites that are going to give you fun information. We can all find that, but that's not good. Brent, what's the, what's the one thing you would say to young people about socialism in general that if they understood it better, might change their thinking away from this sort of frivolous utopianism that they seem to have today. Follow a simple rule. Any authority vested on government is an equal right taken away from you. Anything you choose to let government do is something you can no longer have a choice to do yourself. You gave it to the government. So uh, I would tell young people that, that be careful what you wish for because we can talk about the theory of failed socialism and the, and the world is littered. There's not a single successful socialist state. It's all a degree of failure. But put that aside. Just simply think. If you like your individual freedom, Every time you cede something to government, federal, state, local, whatever it might be, you have surrendered that freedom yourself. So to young people, do you want to surrender your liberty? Give it to government. And you won't get it back. Oh, you'll never get it back. Have you ever heard of a federal program that was ended? There's no such thing. No, no. Well, thanks for being with us, Brent. Thank you, Frank. Well, socialism certainly has its supporters in the media who've enabled our government to grow ever larger, reaching into areas it has no business being. But in reality, socialism is a bankrupt philosophy. Both history and the Bible show it to be a harmful aberration, as Dr. D. James Kennedy shares with us in this portion of his message, The Bankruptcy of Socialism. There is no doubt that our nation today, as a nation, is adrift. We are like a ship without a rudder, a compass, or even a goal. We don't know which way to head, or even which way is which way, because we have turned away from the Word of God, and from the Scriptures, and from the instructions that the founders of this nation and our fathers believed in and looked to and upon which they built this great country. As John Quincy Adams says, that the genius of the American Revolution is that we united in one indissoluble bond the principles of civil government and the principles of Christianity. But that bond is being increasingly severed in our time, and so we are adrift, we are lost. We don't know why we're having the problems that we're having. Though we have seen 
the greatest experiment in socialism in the history of the world in the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics come to a disastrous end, crash in flames and burn, and bring utter disaster and bankruptcy to that nation, and perhaps famine, still socialism is alive, though not well, in America. And I think that one of the great lessons that we need to learn from the events of this past year is that it doesn't work. It doesn't work in the Soviet Union. It doesn't work in Poland. It doesn't work in East Germany. It doesn't work in Cuba. It doesn't work in China. And it doesn't work in America. What is it going to take to wake us up to that fact? Well, we use other names for it. We call it the welfare state, a benevolent government, but it's the same thing regardless of what you call it. In 1830, de Tocqueville came here from France and wrote his famous book, Democracy in America, and he said, quote, America will last until the populace discovers I hope all of you know the end of that sentence. America will last until the populace discovers that it can vote for itself largesse out of the public treasury. Have we ever discovered that? And those of us that were really backward and slow, we have been told about it by commercials telling us, get this little booklet. It'll tell you everything you can get out of the federal government. We've discovered it, and de Tocqueville said, that's as long as we'll last. And my friends, we're on the way down now because of that discovery, because of the socialism that exists in our mixed economy. We've given up the free enterprise economy that the founders of this nation gave to us, America will last until the populace discovers it can vote for itself largesse out of the public treasury. But you know, these things are so benevolent sounding and they, they sound so Christian that we're trying to help people. And it's always that good intentions on the part of some politicians or bureaucrats that leads us into this disaster. But the thing that we need to understand is that the federal government is extraordinarily wasteful and extraordinarily inefficient and also that it creates far more problems than it helps. Professor Thomas Sowell of Stanford University, one of America's leading black economists, said this, that the amount of money necessary to lift every man, woman, and child in America above the poverty line is one-third of what we are currently spending. But because of the incredible wastefulness of the federal government, what we do, he says, is simply find that the money ends up in the pockets of highly paid administrators, consultants, and staff. That's why the two bedroom counties to Washington, D.C., one in Virginia, one in Maryland, have the highest per capita income in America today. But you know, we can't blame it on the politicians, at least certainly not all of it. We often hear that the politicians are just buying our votes by taxing and giving us more things, giving us more things that they take the money from from ourselves. That's true. But why are they doing that? Because when they try to be responsible and when they try to restrain government spending, we vote them right out of office. The problem is with our own hearts, our own greed, our own desire for something for nothing for more and more and more for the, from the government trough. That's the problem, and that's why the politicians act that way. I'll tell you this. If your eyes were open 
and you saw the colossal wastefulness, you saw the mounting federal debt which is going to be disastrous, you saw the inefficiency and ineffectiveness of these government programs, and you know that they don't work and they create more problems than they solve, when a politician tells you that he's going to tax more and spend more, he wouldn't get your vote. But when he told you that he was going to cut taxes and cut spending, he would have your vote and he would stay in. But someone studied the witnesses that come to Congress and all of those committees and make all of their proposals, and for every one that comes and says we need to cut taxes and cut spending, 134 of us come and tell them, spend more, spend more. We want more, more, more from the federal government. The federal government doesn't have anything to begin with. It all comes out of our pockets. May God, through the truth of his word, open our eyes and change our hearts that we might trust in the living God and follow his principles. And my friends, unless we trust in Christ as our Savior, unless we know that his Father has promised to provide all of our needs out of his riches and glory, we're going to continue to look to a provident state and we're going to move more and more into despotism and socialistic tyranny and economic ruin in this country. We need to stand up and say, we have had enough of this. Look what atheism has produced in other parts of the world. We don't want it here. We want the religious freedom that our founders gave to us. We don't want this socialistic massive pottage that you're trying to force on us. We want the free enterprise system that the founders of this country gave to us, which made America the strongest and the most bountiful and plentiful nation that the world had ever seen. Too often, the actual effects of socialism are ignored. People can support an avowed socialist for the highest office in the land only because they have no idea what havoc socialism actually wreaks. But centralized socialistic government brings misery to the people under it, misery that comes in the name of compassion. This has proved true around the world and here in America too we can witness the effects of so-called government compassion in Detroit, Michigan. Our own Jerry Newcomb has more. Recently, in one of the many presidential election debates, the question came up as to what has happened to the city of Detroit. What specifically would you do to bring manufacturing jobs back to America and train residents of cities like Detroit to do those jobs? Let me start by observing that Detroit is a great city with a magnificent legacy that has been utterly decimated by 60 years of failed left-wing policies. Well, we have traveled to Detroit to see firsthand what has actually happened to one of America's formerly great cities and why. We are not in a third world nation. This is Detroit, Michigan. Detroit's a war zone. They came and gave the houses away. Americans need to see what that city looks like because that city is an illustration of what happens when you've got big government in charge. The problems in Detroit are, are manifest, but at the root, they're all government-created problems. Regulations, uh, labor unions, uh, you know, public housing, these are all problems that ultimately you can trace right back to government policies. In the 50s, Detroit was the number one industrial city of America. It was the gem of middle class prosperity. Reverend LaVon Ewell of JoshuaTrail.org has been a Detroit area pastor for 42 years. Detroit used to be one of our most vibrant cities, but now it's lost half of its population. It has a skyrocketing crime rate. So the city's been devastated uh, through the uh, social programs that were employed over 30 years ago. One of the tragedies of this city is that only approximately 30% of their kids graduate. Almost 70% of their kids do not graduate from high school here in Detroit. Coleman Young was definitely a turning point in the city of Detroit. It went from the most prosperous city to one of the poorest cities, and he served the longest. And during his tenure, that's, the city was in decline. 
Coleman Young was influenced by Marxist philosophy and uh, he employed it here in the city. He thought that the more the go he could get the government to do for the city, uh, the better it was. The design of welfare was to make things better for people. And uh, if you give a person a fish, uh, they'll never learn to fish. But if you take and teach them how to fish, they learn how to be self-sufficient. Welfare didn't teach them how to fish. It taught them how to wait for somebody to do for them what they could have done for themselves. And there's one of the reasons why welfare was so counterproductive. When you had a mother that may have seven or eight kids and uh, uh, you know no dad in the home, and welfare discouraged a dad from being in the home. And so that diminished the quality of life in the community as well as discipline in the home. Approximately 30% of the people in Detroit are on welfare and you have an unemployment rate of approximately 50%. It breaks my heart to see what's happened in the last 42 years. There was a time when these neighborhoods were beautiful. The lawns were well maintained and uh, you had houses in every one of these vacant spots. And to think that this is what's happened to a city where the government said they were going to take care of people. This is the tragic end result. Oh, this house 30 years ago, it would, might have been a $100,000 house. It's worthless because it's a de so deteriorated and no one wants to invest in these types of neighborhoods, which is so tragic. Someone might have set this house on fire to get the insurance because it wasn't their house, and so it was easy to do. Detroit has thousands and thousands of homes like this to the extent that the city has given up on rehabilitating many of these communities, and now they're talking about just bulldozing much of the city. Here's the future, Detroit. Is that the direction this country wants to go in? or do we want to return to the, you know, the free enterprise model, private property rights, uh, the things that made this country prosperous and, and free? If we continue to do what Detroit did for 40 years, give people things they didn't work for, give them social programs, we can expect this to happen all over America. For too long, those advocating forms of socialism have been able to take the high road, cloaking their agenda in supposed compassion and benevolence. Meanwhile, the actual results of their policies result in destruction and misery. The media has allowed them to get away with it. And widespread ignorance about what socialism entails has led us to the place where a significant percentage of Americans under age 30 say they prefer socialism to capitalism. But real lives are at stake, which is why it's imperative to get the truth out about socialism. We have two resources to help you do that, and here is my very good friend, Jennifer Kennedy Cassidy, with more. Jennifer, welcome. Thank you, Frank. Most people know the damage caused by communism in the 20th century. Over 100 million people dead, and the forced enslavement of billions. Even today, we see in places like Cuba and North Korea, it still brings misery. But many people think communism's cousin, socialism, is more harmless. However, as you've seen today, that's not the case. Detroit is in ruins because of socialistic policies. Much the same could be said of large portions of Washington, D.C., Chicago, and many other major cities. So how could it be that millions would support a socialist candidate for president of the United States? The answer is, they just don't know the historical and biblical truth. That's why it's imperative that you get the small book, 10 Truths About Socialism, as our thanks for your generous donation. This easy to understand book is packed with information dealing with facts about socialism that everyone needs to know. Did you know that socialism is at war with the family and the church? That its founding architects rejected God? That socialism and tyranny go hand in hand? Those truths and many others can be found in 10 Truths About Socialism, which will send you right away as our thanks for your generous donation. You'll want to read this book and share it with your children and grandchildren. Simply write to us at Box 6085, Albert Lee, Minnesota, 56007, or call toll-free 888-334-9762, or go online to djameskennedy.org. 
Next week, we'll be airing a special program called The Problem of Socialism. This hard-hitting documentary features economics experts and biblical scholars exposing socialism and countering it with biblical truth. This program needs to be seen by everyone in an era when many are claiming socialism is viable and biblical. In reality, neither is true, as we show in The Problem of Socialism. We'll send you a DVD copy of that program, The Problem of Socialism, as our thanks for your generous donation. Simply write to us at Box 6085, Albert Lee, Minnesota, 56007, or call toll-free 888-334-9762, or go online to djameskennedy.org. At root, the problem with socialism is that it stems from a false liberal view of human nature, one arguing that humanity is basically good. Capitalism, or free market economics, proceeds from a conservative view, which holds that humanity is basically fallen. And because of man's fallen nature, he is limited in his knowledge and abilities and inclined to act according to his own best interests, rather than in the best interest of others. The Bible tells us which of these two views is true, and we all know it by experience anyway. We see it on the news daily, and we prove it by locking our doors at night. The supposed optimistic view that we are basically good and getting better might seem better, but it's not. Chairman Mao, Pol Pot, and Joseph Stalin all held this view with the less than optimistic outcome of more than 100 million dead in the 20th century alone. If you are a socialist getting rid of a few or a few million bad apples, apparently that's a small price to pay in the perfection of human nature. In stark contrast, a real free enterprise system based on a true view of fallen humanity reaps enormous benefits. As the economist Walter Williams has said, it forces you to serve your fellow man, providing real value to him in order to get what you want from him in a free market transaction. It's only when we reject false messiahs and elusive utopias and accept that humans are inherently sinful that we get a livable system where people can flourish by receiving value for their efforts through a free and open exchange. And of course, all these things proves God's word is true once again. I'm Frank Wright. Thanks for joining us this week on Truths That Transform. We'll see you next time. Next week on Truths That Transform. Frankly, socialism has the best branding and it appeals to quite legitimate moral intuitions that Christians have. I am upset with the direction that America is going because I came from the place where it didn't work, where America is trying to go now. That's next week. Today's program is available on DVD for your gift to this ministry of any amount. Please call, write, or log on to our website today. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.